afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. John Belkowitz. I'm the Chief Technology Officer here at Intelligent Concrete, where we bring new and emerging technologies to the concrete industry. Purpose of my presentation today is to give you a quick peek into what we like to call the magical world of concrete. Specifically, we're going to be focusing on a progress report on graphene, carbon nanotubes, carbon nanofibers, and concrete. A big change for concrete comes in a small package. Now, the impetus of this presentation is to show you something new, to give you a solution set to a set of problems that we currently have, ultimately to make concrete stronger and last longer. Next slide. Before we get to the meat of the presentation, I'd like to give you a quick little overview background, who I am, what we do, who I work for, uh, just a little bit of credibility, why we should be paying attention today is in the purpose. And I'd like you to hold my toes over the fire and make sure I answer these three questions. And if I don't, either I'll supplement those with the questions that you ask afterwards or we can get you more information after the presentation is done. And, and the motivation for this is key to keep that, that spree de core, to keep the eyes on the prize. Every single one of these slides, it's going to look like death by PowerPoint, but the ultimate objective is a walkaway item that you can go back to as a reference to make these decisions for your day-to-day -day operations. I'll outline the objectives. We'll go through those concisely. I've got 45 minutes to leave 15 minutes for questions. We'll wrap it up with a concise summary. I'll set up the horror story and then open up the floor for any questions. Okay, background, next slide. My name is John Belkowitz. I'm the CTO of Intelligent Concrete where we are concrete enthusiasts. Years ago, Whitney and I created a company where we combined what we understood about some of the most awesome technologies that are oftentimes lost in a university basement, what we needed to do with our commercial laboratories for a combined effort to be that liaison for technical transfer. You know, I started in the United States Air Force uh, in a civil engineering squadron where our objective was provide, prepare, and sustain bases as the platform for the projection of aerospace equipment around the operational continuum. And while that was awesome, the things that I get to do today to enhance the concrete industry, to save the world with all the concrete in it, I don't know, it makes me feel like a concrete superhero. And you should too. That's what we are. We're consultants for the concrete industry, technical representatives with many, many pillars with the ultimate objective of bringing concrete and sustainability innovation to 30 concrete companies by 2030. And we have many means and methods, tools of the trade to help our clients get to that point. And one of those is this presentation, these webinars, and these are our objectives today. Next slide. We're going to discuss techniques, material requirements. I want to set a basic foundation on what the material is, the specific activities and procedures related to the structural properties and aspects of carbon nanotubes, fibers, and graphene. This is a larger part of the presentation. After that, I'm going to take a quick foyer into the universities and some of these really cool concepts that allow us to turn science fiction into ready mix concrete in our concrete job sites. And finally, I'm going to wrap it up with the real crete, book crete, lab crete, real crete, where we see what folks have done not only here in Colorado, but throughout the rest of the world using these carbon allotropes to make concrete stronger, last longer, and do some pretty wild things. So let's, let's focus on our motivation. Why should the ready mix industry care about this? Whether you're a concrete contractor, a producer, an architect, or an engineer alike, you should care about this information. You should hang on this information the edge of your seat with questions about what is the reality of using this tomorrow in my day-to-day -day operations. And the reason why, if I'm the first person to tell you this, I'm sorry. I wish I was there to give you a hug. But we have a limitation on our old options for these many, many problems that we have. Now, I'm not the one to come up with this answer. There are much much smarter people than me that have spent a lot of your taxpayer dollars figuring out what our ready mix providers could have told you a few years ago. 
that most of our engineers who have to design with this technology and are held accountable every day could have said a few more years ago. And our suppliers knew probably a long time ago. But our limitation on quality technology, the, the, the class F fly ash that I used to get when I first got in the industry, $40 a ton, beige in color. You know, that, that poor man's water reducer is the ball bearing in concrete. It made that concrete creamy and dreamy. You couldn't even hear the bull float glide over the surface. Shh, instead of... <laughs> we have a limitation, not only in our class F fly ash. I don't want to pick on one technology, but lithium. When was the last time you got a tanker of lithium? It's just a harsh reality of what we're currently dealing with, that we have a limitation on our old options, but... There's a but. There's a brighter side to this story. There's a light. At the end of the tunnel, we have a wide variety of new options. Not only the technology that we're talking about today, but colloidal silica, alternative supplementary cementitious materials, pond ash, and these things have ASTMs. There's tons of university research, and dare I say, the academic arena has put time and money into it, but also your taxpayer dollars have put a lot of time and effort into investig investigating the realities of these technologies. Next slide. And your motivation should be this. Well, unfortunately, we're not in Florida today, but this is a horror story right here. This is the underside of a bridge. This is concrete falling apart. This is something that's used... Every day, if you were in New Jersey, you were driving over the Kosciuszko Bridge or you were dri driving over the Tappan Zee, you would see the same thing. We have over 600,000 concrete bridges in our national infrastructure, establishing this $48 billion a year industry. Of that, $8.3 billion a year is put back into the yearly maintenance associated with concrete maintenance because of physical and chemical attack. And you know what? These, these numbers need to be updated. Our industry is a little bit bigger and those... That yearly maintenance number is a, a, a little bit larger. Maybe they're three or four years old. The impetus of what I'm trying to tell you is that we need an enhancement of our concrete durability, the way we go after it. And it's not just in sunny Florida, but it's also in Denver, Colorado. And it's for known reasons, not just because, well, John... You know, we've got a lot more people, we've got a lot more traffic, we've got a lot more de-icing salt, we're putting a lot more wear and tear on our concrete, and the concrete you're talking about is 40 years old. Yeah, I get that. But we're still hanging our hat on the same concepts, the same mature technologies, the, despite the fact that our cements have changed. You know, if, if, if we took a real look at the use of our aggregate, Despite the fact that sand is sand, as one engineer told me, and when you put it in concrete, it's all gray and it gets eventually hard. The harsh reality on that is sand is not all sand, whether it's reactivity or balancing the fresh properties with a, a junkier version of what we're used to. I remember in the early 2000s being introduced to the magical sand of Wichita, Kansas. And then if you take all of that out and you only look at the durability mechanisms that we're fighting day to day, whether it's on paper or in lawsuits, method of compensating for these, these physical and, and chemical attack mechanisms are, are class F fly ashes that we've had here in the Western U.S. business unit. They've been gone for a while, at least the one that I was talking about when I was a kid. Not only in price, but not only in quality, not only in quantity. If I have to hear from another entity about the blip in the radar and how we'll get these volumes back after the summer, I, I think I'm going to go you know, crazy. You know, it feels like I'm already at that point because I know I'm not the only one seeing it, but we're at the perfect storm. You know, all these things combined with the, the, the much needed rising construction due to our 7.7 .7 billion population. We've got more people on the road. We've got more houses that are being built. Next slide. We're using more de-icing salts and brines. We're getting more fatigue from our traffic loads. The inevitable reality is we're going to beat up our concrete more and our service lives are going to become shorter. Our landfills are going to become larger. And we're going to have to use up more materials and tear up more mountains and yada, yada, yada. It's just the harsh reality of the 
industry that we work in and the civil infrastructure that we build or maintain that we need to look at our, our solutions a little bit differently. And we need to be open to new ideas. And it's not just the outside concrete. It's the inside concrete too. Y'all who put those ASTM F7010-11 or the 310 whatever those resilient flooring systems, whether it's an epoxy, a VCT, resilient, I, I, I don't care what it is. Subpar concrete leads to delamination of floors, carpets, epoxies. I don't care how pretty they are. You can make a tidal wave on your floor. If you don't start adopting these new technologies today, inevitably you're going to be forced to in the future. It's either that or you're going to be pushed out of the business because of insurance, of lawsuits, a lot of other combinations. The objectives of this presentation are focus on answering the why behind you should take this technology seriously. And I say, take this technology, I'm grouping all these things together. So I'd like to get into our first objective and talk about the history. And I hate history lessons. This was the one subject I was terrible at in school. I don't care what school I went to, it, it was tough for me to get into the reading of the past. But when it comes to something that can be beneficial for concrete, you know, it all began in Texas with a soccer ball in the 1980s. You know, it sounds like a bad Western movie, a bad Western movie that Whitney and I would have watched like 30 times by now. The story of these carbon allotropes starts at a university with a kind of accident. And the way we explain this new molecular structure of carbon is by looking at a football or soccer ball, if you say it the right way. And it's a, a unique structure that was developed by this team where they take 60 carbon atoms, put them in a ball, and for some reason when they're in this, this soccer-like hexagonal structure, they have these amazing properties, not only for, well, we'll get into that later. And I tell you, it's, it's not many pages. It's a great read. They talk about soccer or football. You know, we got folks here from Germany. Thanks for showing up, y'all. So we've got to say soccer and football here, but it's a great, pa a great paper. And the bonus is it allows me to talk about not only the 1980s, 1985 is one of my favorite years, but every single one of the papers that I talk about and I reference to the link is available in this slide. So you don't have to go looking for it. It's not gonna be a reference slide later that you have to copy and paste. You literally just have to click on that link and it'll take you to that paper, which is free online. Um, so this will be available PDF version, low resolution, so nobody's gonna swipe the pictures, but we want you to be able to have this information for collateral. So let's get into the foundation for this discussion. And uh, I was talking to an, uh, an amazing person yesterday uh, about one of the engineers in the industry, one of the scientists in the industry that uh, I very, uh, very inspired by, motivated by, and um, we discussed the necessity for foundations of a discussion. And I wanted to go into some of the science and some of the definitions. And it's necessary for us to sit, set a foundation because we're getting into a realm that, that will, will, will take you out of your comfort zone, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with, with you not liking some of the words that I'm going to say, and let's start with an allotrope of carbon. I'm not trying to sound fancy, but it's a, a, a technical way of saying a different microstructure of an element. And with carbon, we have so many different types of these. I think there's eight different types of these microstructures, but we only care about three. This conversation is not about CO2 or calcium carbonate, or diamond. It's about graphene, carbon nanotubes, and carbon nanofibers. And, you know, breaking them down is important. I want to show you what they are, you know, a Homeric, a 50,000-foot view, and then I want to show you what's different between each one of them. I want to focus on the benefits and the negative side effects. And, yes, this is a persuasive discussion. I want you to try and prove me wrong at the very least. This guy don't know what he's talking about. For some reason, your voice in my head sounds like John Wayne. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to prove him wrong. You prove me wrong, I'll get you a steak dinner. Now, next slide. 
Why does the science matter, John? Why do I need to pay attention? It's important to recognize that there is a difference between CO2, graphite, and the three that we're going to talk about today. They might have carbon as a base, but because of the different structures, I know that sounds wacky, but because of the different structures, they can give you a different type of benefit than the other allotropes or structures of carbon. Now, I tell you, there's a wonderful paper published in 2014 that goes into these different microstructures, but it all goes back to the bonds. And I know every single one of us had gone through grade school, junior high school, high school, or got your GED, GES, whatever they're called, but we all know that everything, all matter in life is connected by electrical bonds. And specific to these carbon bonds, these carbon to carbon bonds, these covalent bonds, when they get into a very specific type of structure, they start doing some wild things that if we can create, we can facilitate those things being a part of our concrete composite, we can steal an advantage from them. And of course, this is the why do these matter? And we're going to go into that second, but the next most important question is, will I be tested after this webinar? Yeah, you might be tested. No, I'm joking. You're not going to be tested. But first and foremost, why do these microstructure matters? Because based on the microstructure you have, there are different properties that are going to result. And of course, based on those different properties, not only is it properties that we can impart on our concrete composite within the hydrated cement matrix and more, but it's also how do we deliver it? Because I tell you something, a lot of these nanoparticles, folks don't like using them in dry. They like using them in suspension. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we don't like using them dry and I can spend an entire presentation on that, but let's just focus on the fact that it's easier to get them distributed throughout the concrete to do their job when the carbon nanotubes, the graphene, the carbon nanofibers are in a liquid suspension because ultimately we want to make them part of the concrete composite. So the last question, will I be tested after this webinar? No, no, obviously you're not going to. No, but, but come on, y'all. You know, I know you know nothing about this. You're not expected. And if you do know a lot about this, then I apologize. I'm not talking to you. But for the folks who don't know enough about this to make a decision, what's your excuse? Like there's Google Scholar. There's Google. There's Alta Vista. You know, Yahoo. All of this will take you to different sites where there is free information on nanotechnology including the three that we're going to talk about today. Well, John, I don't know new technology and I can't figure out. Come on. Let's go, Bob. You can figure out your iPhone. You can, you can figure out how to use Bejeweled. You can figure out how to use this. And y'all are the experts. When they talk about making carbon more or concrete more carbon efficient, I keep wondering why they don't go to the ready mix industry, our concrete engineers and our concrete formulators. I don't need somebody who builds computers to tell me how to make concrete better. I know who to talk to. There are folks in the industry who know how to increase the, the efficiency of concrete. Dude, this is one of those tools in the toolbox. So my expectation is that we're not going to have a test. We're going to take those different prospects, the concepts that are afforded by our academic arena and other folks outside of the industry who get a different perspective. Whether or not they build computers, let them show us the perspective. But we know how to make concrete creamy and dreamy and concrete stronger and last longer. This is another tool in your toolbox. So this is what those microstructures look like. Everything from diamond, which, you know, we're used to diamond not only being in rings, but also on cutting tools, to the graphene and nanotubes that we're talking about today. And remember I spoke about the different arrangements, those, those covalent bonds that lead to that different strength and those different properties. Now, it's... In diamond, it's an SP3 bond. Again, you're not being tested, but it's a special bond within the graphene and the carbon nanotube that not only makes it the strongest and lightest material in the world, but it also makes it fairly tough to work with. Next slide. I did want you to take a look at what these things look like on the microstructure, but also in a picture form too. So on the left, we have a, a, a shot 
of what dry nanoparticles look like in you, or dry carbon nanotubes and then dry carbon nanofibers look like. And it's a dry powder. You can buy these on Amazon. You can get these from different websites. Then what you can do is you can suspend them in water. There's a bunch of papers that go into it. And this is what we did. We suspended it in water. And the unfortunate reality is some of these technologies, those bonds make them not only so strong and so lightweight and so this, that, and the other, that not only do they do amazing things like I just mentioned, but they don't like staying in water for very long. And that separates a lot of the technologies. Can we deliver this technology, not just to the lab, which, hey, that academic arena, it delivers some great things, but it is book crete and lab crete, not real crete. The better question is, can we deliver it to the ready mix industry? And that's really what separates the products that are out there. Unfortunately, that's not part of this presentation, but there are wonderful folks out there who can help you get you know, up to date adopting this set of technologies. Okay, so we got a liquid dispersion. It's ink-like. It's got a very, very low solids content, but ultimately fits into the critical path of concrete sequencing, just like any other concrete additives. But under a high-powered microscope, this is what those technologies look like. And it, it literally looks like penne pasta. You know, this is the carbon nanotube, and it's a wonderful paper. Uh, and just for a reference, we got a diameter here about 20 nanometers. It's about a 20, uh, or this is a 20 nanometer multi-wall carbon nanotube. But bear in mind, a strand of hair on the human head is around 100 to 150,000 nanometers in diameter, so 100,000 to 150,000 nanometers in diameter. So we're talking about something that is much, much smaller, not only than a human hair, but the technology that we're used to using out in the industry. And what can it do? Why do we care so much? Well, first, whenever you put these carbon nanotubes, carbon nanofibers and graphene and concrete, really any nanotechnology to be fair, you see a positive impact on fresh properties. There is a reduction in bleeding. There is a, a creamy and dreaminess that you just don't get from conventional concrete. And it's all part and parcel to an increase in cement efficiency from the second thing, that heterogeneous nucleation. Now, heterogeneous nucleation, just a fancy flipping way of saying something is really small, so other things will grow on it. And not only does that have an impact on the hydrated cement matrix of concrete, that, that matrix of our concrete composite, but it also has a positive impact on the interfacial zone of our uh, aggregate and cement body interface. And by doing so, it creates a more homogeneous or well-defined composite. So we ultimately get that third item, an increase in strength and toughness of the concrete matrix because of those carbon nanotubes and the energy that they're gonna absorb that would ultimately lead to catastrophic failure of our concrete. Next slide. So the different types. Okay, we got graphene. That's like the purest single sheet form. You know, I'm sure a lot of folks have heard about graphite. Graphene is a monolayer, a flat sheet of carbon atoms in this hexagonal honeycomb form, and it's got no defects to it. And, um, you know, there's these two pictures of some great papers. That is an artist's rendering. Yeah, there's no bullet that's going to hit the sheet like that. We're talking nanometers, so, you know, a little bit bigger than a water molecule. But the benefits that we see out of this material, you know, higher thermal conductivity, higher electricity or electrical conductivity, strength, flexibility, hardness, chemical resistance, antibacterial, and more and more and more. It is just one of the most awesome technologies in the world. But there are some negative side effects, you know, because this stuff is so pure, because it likes working with itself and being so strong, it's rare that it can be suspended in, in suspension uh, for a long period of time. Um, and ultimately, once you do get to that point, and we'll talk about functionalizing later, there is, has been a tightening, a slump, uh, and... The unfortunate reality, all of these pure forms that have not been functionalized properly, um, you can get to a point that there is a diminished return that adding more of this stuff does not really help, but it oftentimes can lead to agglomeration. So again, it's important to work with the right technology as it's been designed, not only 
in the book in lab side, but also the real side that's delivered to your job site in a bucket or to your ready mix plant. The next one is the carbon nanotube, and carbon nanotubes are, are quite different in the fact that they're still of the raw material that makes up the graphene sheet, that honeycombed um, uh, structure of carbon. I've got a, a representation here from one of the papers, but instead of it being a flat sheet, now take it and roll it up on itself. And depending on the direction that you start, whether you start at one corner versus the other in the middle, or it's going to decide what type of carbon nanotube is, and that's called the chirality of it. And you can have different types of um, carbon nanotubes, single-walled or multi-walled carbon nanotubes, but ultimately they're going to have similar benefits as the graphene. Um, what you'll see out of it is also that, that inability to hold it in suspension uh, and rarely, rarely are both of these delivered in dry form. I have heard, I have read, and I'll let you make that decision. Um, that's not part of this conversation, but bear in mind, you know, you do have difficulties of taking this dry powder and dispersing it in a ready-mix truck when it's a dry form. And ultimately, you do run into those negative sides of it. But, you know, once you get past those, once you can overcome those negative side effects... Those benefits, you'll see them throughout the service life. Okay, so now let's get on to the carbon nanofiber. What's different about the carbon nanofiber is in the way that it's built or even in the look of it. It can still be made up of a graphene sheet, but this time it's going to be single-walled and it's going to have multiple defects. It could be also of a stuck, stacked excuse me, cup variety there are different forms, but ultimately what you're doing here is introducing um, defects. And of course, because you're introducing those defects, you're going to be losing out on some of these properties. But what you get from that is a higher stability in suspension. And in a way, these defects create something that's called a functionalization. Now, functionalization is extremely important, and that's what separates a lot of these manufacturers and distributors when it comes to delivering this technology. Now, I've got this wonderful paper that I wrote during my, pre my presentation, during my PhD on functionalization of carbon nanotubes. And I tell you something, it's, it's one of the papers on our blog that has been there the longest. It only has a 17% reading ratio. So... I won't be hurt if you don't get through it, but it talks a lot about what it means to functionalize a, a carbon nanotube, carbon nanofiber for use in a polymer matrix. Not only how do you do that, but the, the different types of ways to do that that are used in the industry. Okay, next slide. So what are the benefits, the, the ones that we care about? Elasticity, flexibility, hardness, chemical resistance. That's what I'm going to focus on especially that antibacterial one. And that's, you know, all of those go back to making that concrete stronger and last longer. And ultimately, you know, we've got tough concrete and we've got concrete that's got to be tough here in Colorado. This ain't Rome, Italy. You know, this ain't North Carolina. You know, we, we've got de-icing salts and brines. We've got, you know, medicinal marijuana that came to Denver. You know, you look at Denver International Airport and the number of people who are flying in compared to what was projected at this time. Like our population has grown and so are those traffic loads. We need other solutions. And what we have found, next slide, is that not only do we make that concrete easier to manage on the job site, reducing that bleed water, stabilization of air, you know, all these fresh property things, you know, my ready mix providers, my finishers should like to hear this stuff. The ultimate, I mean, making a creamier and dreamier concrete so we don't have to see this on the job site. Every time I go on a job site and see somebody blessing the concrete, I want to say, stop. But of course, I stop myself because they're just trying to get that concrete closed up and the job site done by 4.30 in the afternoon, and I understand it. We live in a harsh environment, and all these four properties and more are what we get from these different allotropes. Now, those different allotropes, the graphene, CNT, CNF, we also see an increase in compressive strength, flexural strength. I mean, the flexural strength especially, that's what it's designed to do. 
there is a reduction in permeability that often leads to an increase in resiliency to not only concrete corrosion, but steel corrosion. Again, these are things that you often find with most nanotechnologies, but that increase in abrasion resistance, flexural strength, splitting tensile strength, especially that bacterial removal, I mean, that's really singled out to carbon nanotubes. But I want to focus on the different types of cement composites that we see with these allotropes. And today I am going to talk about pervious concrete, shotcrete, and I believe I'm talking about concrete too. I am, I am. Um, and what I want to focus on is, I'm not doing shotcrete today, excuse me, uh, but I want to focus on why they were used, how they were used, and the type of technology it was. And some of these, I mean, this is what you can do in your ready mix plant tomorrow. Specification activity. Please bear in mind, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. I am doing a lot of work on this with nanosilica, colloidal silica, and concrete, and it has been a mighty awesome road. There are committees that are doing great work, and there are folks on this phone call that have been standing up in those conference rooms and those committees and giving talks and being part of, but not enough has been done. And the unfortunate reality is until we start moving forward on those codes, and yes, I know I'm asking folks to do work for free, but until we start doing that, it's going to be a harder road for these technologies. Next slide. So somebody approaches you, I've got graphene, I've got carbon nanofibers, I've got car carbon nanotubes, you should use it in your concrete. Cool. These are the questions. If I was a ready mix provider, let's say I'm in Colorado or Texas and I want to make 1.4 million cubic yards a year and I'm going to buy 30 trucks next week and da-da-da-da-da. These are the five questions I would ask. And, you know, the first question is probably the most snarky and it's not meant to be, but are we using this technology for real? Is it, do, do we have enough material? Are we going to make money off of this? Are we going to, who are going to pass the cost on to? You know, is there going to be a learning curve? And once you get through these questions, you know, there's a wonderful book called Getting to Yes. And if you've never read it, it focuses on why people say no to new things. And these are real questions that we often, you know, irrationalize the concept because of these answers. You know, is the technology for technology's sake is a real question. I think that's easy to answer. It's easy to answer, especially if we focus on question number two. What are we trying to solve here in Colorado? We have a de-icing salt problem, a de-icing brine, an abrasion resistance, a traffic, so on and so forth. I mean, it's also a material issue. Now, it can solve, these technologies can solve a, pro a lot of problems, but here's another unfortunate reality that I wanted to share with you besides that Class F fly ash debacle. This technology is going to cost. You're going to have to put it onto your client. I know. That's terrible. Technology costs money. If you want to make concrete sustainable, you got to spend money. You want to make it last, you want to be stronger, last longer, creamy, dreamy, you're going to have to pay for it. Yeah, you might be able to take some cement out. But hey, anything new. If I told you that a, 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 a 1985 Maserati, or forget Maserati, let's say Lamborghini, let's say a 2020 Aventador Lamborghini cost $25,000. I could get it for you today. Uh, you would wave the BS flag. When something is good, there's an investment to be made. And that investment should return a benefit not only to the ready mix provider, but to the end user. And that goes back to question number four. What is your plan to, te to get technology into operations? And it shouldn't be, oh, I'm just going to teach my salesman and they're going to do it. It has to be a, a bridge between the manufacturer, contractor, end user, whether that's architect, engineer, owner alike, because it all leads up to that final question, how do we get the entire concrete team bought in to include that list? Shoot, throw drivers in there too. Everybody's got to be part of this. This is a paradigm shift. All these things that I talked about and more. So let's get into some of these really cool ideas, and then we're going to jump into um, case studies. So a um, lot of universities. I mean, started in 1985, and there has been concepts going since then. Um, Self-sensing concrete from the University of Houston. Pervious concrete that filters out pathogens and nasty concrete or nastiness using carbon nanotubes. 
increasing blast resistance, enhancing RCA. You know, I, I did a video, I think it was last year, on the disconnect between the academic arena and the concrete industry. And, you know, I'm fortunate that I get to speak to both. And oftentimes when I, I, I sit in a conference or I sit, you know, interviewing somebody who's in the academic arena, I ask them, so how's this technology going to benefit the industry? And it's dead silence. I bet you some of you are chuckling right now. You knew that was the answer. But the funny thing is when I go out to the industry and I ask folks out in the industry, contractors, finishers, ready mix providers, y'all ever read a paper? You know, from University of Houston or MIT, I, I get another chuckle. Ha! That stuff isn't real world. That's what I talk about when I focus on bridging the disconnect. Now, if you're not that person, if you're not that entity, I'm so sorry. I apologize. But the harsh reality is, is that we have some awesome new and emerging technologies that your taxpayer is paying for, that your taxpayer dollars are paying for, that's going unused. It's getting lost in that basement. And it's free online. You can read about it. You can contact these people. And they'd love to be part of some type of, of collaboration to get their technology out into the field, especially if they could publish it. So will you be tested after this? No. But read those papers. There's so much information available. Go after it. And if you don't know what the word means, look it up. I don't care what your education level is. You're going to fall in love with this stuff. These people who write these papers love concrete as much as you do. They're concrete superheroes just like you are. All right, let's get into these case studies. I'm almost out of time here. So case study one, I talked about this pervious concrete. Case study done by University of Alaska looking at pervious concrete, and I ripped and stripped this from the paper, and there's the link for it. But they were looking at pervious concrete with and without, or the cement with and without fly ash, and they were using something called graphene oxide. It's an oxidized ver version of the graphene sheets that I showed you before, and again, that's normally done to help keep that stuff in suspension. So they did it on pervious concrete for stormwater drains, air and train concrete. The type of allotrope they were using was that graphene oxide. It was in a liquid suspension, and from the paper, again, I want you to read this, it says... The reason they used the technology was the advance of scientific knowledge of nanotechnology by using it to expand the use of industrial waste and recycled materials in pervious concrete. <laughs> Come on now. I mean, and they were only using a spit. They were only using a modicum, 0.1% by addition of binder work, binder. And how did it work? It increased strength. It increased resiliency to salt scaling. I mean, yeah, there's all this data that you can dive into, but you need to try this out for yourself. If you make per pervious, especially for pavements or stormwater, then you need to focus on this technology and how it can make your pervious pavements stronger and last longer. Next case study. This was something that was done in our own backyard. A CDOT Class E 12-hour mix. It was done at UCD. We've got the link right there for you back in 2018. What type of concrete? It was a fast track pavement designed to open up traffic at 12 hours, air and trained. It was at a rupture strength, a flexural strength of 650 PSI, 28 days. Compressive strength of 4,200 PSI. Type of carbon allotrope used was a multi-wall carbon nanotube and a liquid suspension. And from the paper... The city encounter of Denver was primarily interested in testing carbon nanotubes as an admixture to help reduce road weight maintenance due to its lower permeability, reduced shrinkage, and increased resistance to freeze thaw. If there is anybody who builds homes for a living, and you know who I'm talking to in Colorado Springs, you're building 15 homes right now. Shoot, I got a subdivision going up in the middle of East Bumble in Elbert County out here of 500 units. You're in Colorado. We use de-icing brines and de-icing salts like a champ out here. I don't care how old you think the concrete is, but as soon as the homeowner can, can, can get into their house, you're going to get those de-icing salts and brines and it's going to start wearing and tearing on your concrete. And the unfortunate reality that you're going to have to deal with might be in the form of a lawsuit. So what I'd like to call this is, hey, if you were worried about a risk, I love it when people talk to me about, oh, John, there's such a risk when using new technology. 
you're dealing with risk right now. Some of these technologies can give you an umbrella of insurance. And if I have insurance companies on the phone, you need to listen to this loud and clear. It's going to give your ready mix providers an umbrella of insurance policy when it comes to the nasty behavior or the nasty environment we have here in Colorado on residential communities, on driveways, curbing gutters. Those homeowners association, as well as those folks who have a lot of money in their pockets on those fancy subdivisions, they like suing our ready mix providers and our contractors. This technology can give you a peace of mind or at the very least increase the concrete's resiliency to that abrasive wear and freeze-thaw environment combined. Now, in this research, we used two different amounts, two gallons per yard, three gallons per yard, and the results were flipping awesome. Not only did we see an increase in strength, and in situations like this, we've seen an increase in the concrete resiliency, and I'm excited for those photos and that information to get published in our own backyard. Next case study. This one was done, University of Houston, and I know I'm cheating a little bit. I'm sorry. I promise case studies. This technically is a case study. I want to focus for a second what this case study is on. And I, I, I picked a clickbait title. I call it Conscious Concrete. And these folks at University of Houston figured out a way of taking carbon nanofibers and creating a sensor out of it so the concrete not only will tell you when it cracks, but it'll tell you the force at which it cracked. And they put it not only in flexural beams, but they also did it in this case study to concrete columns, and they used the conventional concrete. But the type of allotrope that they used was this nanofiber smart mortar cube, and the, the ultimate, the impetus behind using the technology was embedded in reinforced or pre-stressed concrete structures and used to monitor early strength, determine the localized damage, or measure the temperature in a structure. And if you're one of the engineers out there who designed pre-stressed concrete or pre-cast concrete measure, members for infrastructure, this should set some alarms off and you should say, come on, there's no way they turn concrete into a conscious thing. There wasn't much of the technology used. It was placed strategically, next slide, and you can see where they placed it throughout the column. Now, through their work, they monitor cyclic loads on the concrete column. It wasn't just an instantaneous load, but these concrete sensors, not only placed at the base of the column, not only at the foundation, but throughout the column, although three of them failed, they were able to monitor not only the strain behavior before failure, but strain behavior as it failed from t fatigue and BT dubs, there's one of the concrete nanofiber aggregate sensors there. I mean, we are able not only to send people to the moon with this technology, but we are able to make our concrete conscious. And this is where I want to summarize it. When I started this, I wanted to, to answer the question, why should the ready mix industry care? And I brought up these ongoing problems. And that's the reality of what we got to deal with. We've got concrete bleeding to death in our parking garages. And we're constantly falling back on limited technologies and saying, hey, this blip in the radar will pass once the summer is over. <sighs> Come on. There are some new and amazing technologies that have been perfected in the lab. They've been proven successfully in the field. At this point, we're communicating it to you. If I'm communicating it to you now, that means more than likely it's been in the academic arena for about a decade. And when it comes down to it, it's been even more. My job is to educate, not just our local industry. You know, what, what is the motive for John Belkowitz for Intelligent Concrete to invest a lot of money into putting this together and giving it free online because I'm seeing my industry not make a move as soon as it should. We're waiting until the last minute to make a decision about what we're going to do for a new tool in the toolbox. It's going to hurt. Now, before I wanted to open up the floor for any questions, 
I want it to remind us of the horror stories that we deal with from day to day. We're putting on concrete through more wear and tear. And not only do we have to deal with problems like this, but even worse, there's no filter on these photographs. These are real concrete structures that are in place now that folks have to deal with. Thankfully, none of us have to deal with since these structures are not in Colorado. But we have bridges that got pieces falling off every day. We got bridges where you can see the reinforcement. We got concrete highways where it's exposed aggregate and we didn't even have to pay for it. There are concrete structures here that should have been replaced a while ago. There are some amazing, awesome new and in tech, new technologies that have just given the chance, a real chance, throughout the entire team. They can give us a solution to the many problem, problems that plague us day to day, whether that's chemical, physical attack, or bringing the cost down. You know, years ago, my boss... The CEO and president of our company, Whitney Wonsei, said our biggest problem is that we are solving today's problems with yesterday's technologies. You, everybody on this presentation, is the superhero that will make change. And if you don't know how to, that is not as an excuse. A great place to start, check out any of our links YouTube, website, LinkedIn, any of them. And we have created so many different avenues for education. We have over 800 videos that focus on education. Some of them are going to be able to help you. Some of them aren't. And if that's not your cup of tea, there are much smarter people who are willing to help if you would only ask. Now is the time for change. You know, there's a Chinese proverb. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. I'd like to leave this presentation with a quote. It's from a wonderful book written in, I believe it was in the early 40s, late 40s, by Earl J. Hadley, and it's called The Magic Gray Powder. And please excuse some of the pronouns. They are outdated, so when you hear... Him, think they or there. From the time an American opens his eyes in the morning until he closes them again at night, the hours of his day are virtually filled with the services of cement. He would ask himself, if he stopped to think, whether any other discovery of man touches his life at so many points. If on the other, so- if on the other hand, he is engaged in the business of making concrete, he would already understand its significance. He would understand that he's doing more things for more people and more permanently for their welfare than he would be doing in a similar position in many other industries. All right, I'd like to thank you for your time and open up the floor for any questions.